Bushu, Tansi, Ong, Tanishi. Thank you for joining us today for storytelling, knowledge sharing, and a celebration of people's ideas to help our community. My name is Darian, and I am an Indigenous knowledge gatherer with the Action Research on Chronic Homelessness Project, or ARCH. The ARCH project in Brandon is a community Indigenous culturally based research project. It is studying the paths that lead Indigenous people from rural and remote communities into homelessness in Brandon. Funded by Infrastructure Canada and hosted by the Brandon Neighbourhood Renewal Corporation, this research is also looking for ways Indigenous people can avoid or leave homelessness to live safely housed in the communities of their choice. Since November, the ARCH project has interviewed over 100 Indigenous people in Brandon who are living unhoused or have recently lived unhoused. <laughs> These storytellers and knowledge keepers gener generously shared their stories that led to homelessness and their insightful ideas and solutions to reduce homelessness and improve the lives in our city. In addition to stories, we will be sharing ideas and project solutions provided by our 102 Indigenous interviewees. The ARCH project will be testing and researching these ideas in Brandon. The ARCH Brandon research will continue in the summer when we travel to rural and remote communities identified by interviewees as their communities of origin. This fall, ARCH Brandon will hold community sharing circles to further explore connections between homelessness and corrections, substance use, mental health, and child protection. Please be aware that some of their stories are upsetting and they can be triggering for people. Topics covered today will include adoption, foster care, residential schools, abuse, violence, and other distressing themes. If you need some extra support during this event, we have aunties, kookums, and kushis ready to love on you with tea, smudging, or hugs. You can find them pretty easily. They're the ones that are wearing the brightly colored kookum scarves. If you are a member of the general audience that chose to wear a kookum scarf today, we're pretty sure that you're already a kookum, so feel free to just do your thing um, if someone in need approaches you. If you need a quiet place to reflect, there is a smudging room and quiet space available in the green room out the doors to the left of the stage. Today, we will be sharing some stories. Unfortunately, we do not have time to share all of the stories that have been told to us. Stories have been edited for length and for clarity. Stories will be read by various readers today. Our trickster narrator will be Michelle, and Fred will be opening and closing our ceremony. We will also be joined by dancers. Tim and his group will be drumming and singing. For many of our participants, sharing in front of a crowd is a very new experience for them. Please be encouraging as you join us on this journey. Please turn off your cell phones and no flash photography. At the end of our ceremony, as we leave the auditorium, you will be offered tobacco from men in our community who keep traditional knowledge. Feel free to accept the tobacco if you wish. We would like to acknowledge the spirits who have passed on from our community over the last few years. There is a memorial table in the foyer where you can go to reflect and write a message, memory, or a prayer. These papers will be burnt in a fire after this event. There are washrooms on both sides of the foyer that are equipped with sharps containers. After the stories have been told, please join us for Bannock and a variety of herbal indigenous teas from Parento's Gourmet Food in Saskatchewan, Running Bear Medicines from Minnetonis, Manitoba, tea picked by Indigenous people in northern Saskatchewan for Boreal Heartland, Wildland Foods from San Clara, Manitoba. There will also be an art show in the foyer. Many of our street folks in Brandon are talented artists. They are sharing their gifts, stories, and ideas today in a visual way at this art show. In the foyer, there is also a map that shows all the places that people have lived on their journeys to Brandon. As the song goes, I've been everywhere, man. I've traveled, I've had my share, man. Our folks have been everywhere from Newfoundland to Vancouver Island and from Yukon to Arizona. There will also be a box in the foyer to collect any reflections, thoughts, ideas, or feedback about your experience today. So we ask that you take a deep breath and open your heart.
Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. Um, I'm going to introduce myself. I'm Hawk Warrior Blue Sky Wolf Medicine. My English name is Frederick Wood. Um, I'm just going to do an opening prayer. Uh, Creator, I'm here today to ask you for your for uh, forgiveness, uh, to give me the strength to carry on with my days, to watch over our loved ones, to watch everyone, everyone here in this audience, the, our drummers, our dancers, our speakers. Uh, I just like to say miigwech and metakiwas. Thank you. Anse. Hello. Kawaskan is mut mig swiske on the snigas and oni pages munina. Ah, my name is Round Dance Eagle Woman. I am a sun dancer. When do kadibates get creator God our creator can anas komite nana nusagi sigat. We thank you for today. Ebe mama win to aga nusagi sigat. Joined together today, we've come to listen to these people telling their stories. Um, we thank everyone that's here, the drummers, singers. Onimi tuak dancers. Hinaga geno kino aga piendu tamek for all of you that came to listen. Kina naskomit nan. We thank you all. Mina na naskomana na goe onini wak kawi arutagik. Oda tanuge wak. We thank the storytellers. Esuge teetik. They're brave. They got strong hearts. To remember that it is hard. For people to tell their story. But every time you tell your story, you heal your spirit. You give a little bit of that story to Creator. In Anaskamit Nangagano, we thank you all. We thank all the workers that work together, to put together this event. We pray that everything goes well. We pray that everything goes well. In wellness towards good life. How I will say. Amen. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Landing Hummingbird. Uh, my name that the government gave me is Michelle Klein. Um, I'd like to first off thank all the, organize all the organizers that are here today. I'll be your MC today uh, and all the participants. Um, like it's mentioned before, these are very uh, real stories that we're going to be telling here today. <clears throat> so to start off, um, I wear these stories like a second skin. I am all their stories, present, past, and future. Today you get to listen, today you get to learn. The stories you will hear won't be easy to tell. They are not easy to swallow, digest, and forget. We hope these stories stay with you and you think about what they mean. <clears throat> if you offer your help, please offer your kindness. If you, if you offer your service, you can offer your patience. Above all else, please do not offer judgments of any kind. You're going to learn why in just a second. I was born in Norway House Cree Nation. 
I made my way to Brandon here back in the 80s to go and find a job. That I would look after myself and my family. It worked out really well. The last couple of years, I retired, but I just, I can't seem to get enough to pay the bills and eat at the same time. It's either one or the other. Either I eat or I pay the bills. Over the years, family is gone, but my friends are still here. They can't help as much as they would like to. They're kind of in the same position as I am. They're no in position to help, really. So I just get by by doing what I do. Man, I just hope for the best every day. That's all about I can say about that. trying to find a place to live. It's been the hardest. I've been looking since the middle of June. The places I was living in, it burnt down. I haven't been able to even get a sniff of any place to live here in Brandon. It's like I'm not allowed to rent anywhere. Everything's good until they find out I'm on pension. Or before, it was EIA. Unless you're working or something like that, nobody really wants to rent to you. They say no discrimination, but at the end of the day, if you're discriminating whether a person is working or not, I mean, that's kind of a discrimination of sorts. And then being Aboriginal, I don't know, it really seems harder. I never really thought about it as much as that, but you know, the more I'm into this now, the last four, five, six months since June, I just, it's all too much, really. I'm realizing it's not so much where your money's coming from, it's whether you're white or not. And I try to break free of anything, and I try, and I try, and I, sat, I just, I can't seem to get any further ahead, you know? All of a sudden, it's just three steps backwards, two steps forward, and then three steps backwards. I'm always further back after I try to do something better than what I was before, than when I started. So, I've always been able to look after myself. I don't have the greatest pension in the world, but hey, it's something. I keep trying. One of these times, I'm sure it'll pay off. I just want a place to live. Not that I want to live there for free. I can pay rent and everything, but some of these places that are running the property managements and stuff, they just have so many different rules. And I, I just, I don't know, I can't, I can't understand it. Why wouldn't you give someone a chance to prove themselves? instead of just making assumptions. The landlords say, I've rented to your people before. I don't like to rent to your kind of people. Well, what kind of people is that? You know, what, a, what, what, do, what do you mean? Like, what, what is the answer to that? To me, that just screams of this kind of discrimination and racism and everything else like that. Where do I go from here? I think every day, why don't I just smash a window or just get arrested, go to jail? At least I got a place to live. At least I got a roof over my head. I got three square meals a day to look after myself. To me, it just doesn't make any sense. I've gone my whole life without a record, and now it just seems like I have to do something like that to even get a place to live. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Well, this isn't the first story of discrimination that I've heard when people have tried to get housing. <clears throat> like, doesn't it cost more to put people in jail than house them? If we can afford to put them <clears throat> in jail, then why can't we afford to house them? But how many generations back does this go even? 
Our next uh, person telling our story is Marcel. My great great Kunchi Ben, we called her, was a very strong woman, never spoke a word of English. She spoke Dakota language fluently and told us she remembers clearly being 12 years old and helping some of the warriors at Wounded Knee. And coming across the borders with Sitting Bull, she lived until she was 113 when she died. My great great Kunshi. The great Kunshi, we called her. She had three other sisters that all lived to 110. 108, and 104. So there was four sisters, and my Kunshi Ben, who was a 100-year-old, 113-year-old Kunshi. My great, great, great grandfather's name was Sue Ben. But it wasn't actually Sue Ben. That's how we got the name Ben, from a white man. He was a half-brother of Crazy Horse. So Crazy Horse is in my family. Sue Ben, a more older and more experienced warrior, he did a lot of battles with other tribes. He helped them and went with Crazy Horse when he was younger. He was just starting off riding horses and going hunting. He would go on a hunting party and usually take a few of us young guys and older guys and we'd look after the horses, due to skinning and breaking down fast whatever they killed, like deer and that. The inner parts of the body were used to hold water, and we were the ones who did all that work, and the hunters just hunted, hunted and killed. The butchering was awesome. There were a lot of teachings that I still tried to pass down to younger people, just by word of mouth, or if I'm out there, then I have a chance to show them, and these are the things we do to pass it on. Keep the culture going, and to keep it alive. And in so many ways, after leaving Birtel, I slowly but surely drifted away from my culture. I wasn't dancing at traditional powwows. I used to be a grass dancer for a while. I used to be a traditional dancer and looking and wishing that we were gonna go home. It's hard. I really put myself in a hole with my depression. I just couldn't live without my wife. I don't mean suicide. I just, I just chose a harsh course for myself. <clears throat> Miigwech. Um, how do we make things better in Brandon for you, Marcel? Information about program has to be passed through word of mouth to each other. They're making these programs and they're doing for everyone out on the streets. We gotta find a way to make sure everyone gets told what's happening instead of someone, instead of letting some, sometimes you get someone telling you this, sometimes it's just word of mouth. Maybe adding some stuff that wasn't even told by the people there. Having these programs or whatever, they're having to help the homeless people in Brandon. It's hard for the ones who are stuck like that, not getting the full understanding of what was happening in these programs because they couldn't read the material and they're just asking questions. Hearing it like that is hard to understand then you got a bunch of people telling you different parts of the program and other parts of another. Miigwech. Okay, so this actually brings us to our first project that we're gonna be trying out. Um, so during his interview, Marcel noted that some homeless people here in Brandon don't know what's happening in the, 
in the community. He was particularly concerned about the people who have difficulties with reading. Another interviewee named Abby echoed Marcel's comment and said that the homeless community needs to be able to share information better. One concern that was raised several times by interviewees was the difficulties that newly arrived people in the community have with finding homelessness services. Some folks, like Leonard, commented on how they make an effort to help newcomers to Brandon. In response to these concerns, the ARCH project is going to test the idea of Word on the Street, which is going to be a weekly video update about news and events in the homelessness community in Brandon. Using an online app, the video update will be broadcast on monitors located throughout social service agencies in the city. Word on the street will tell people about upcoming community events, changes in service agency hours, funeral announcements, inclement weather forecasts, contaminated drug warnings, available food options, missing persons bulletins, local services available in the community, and any other information that might be of interest to our community members. This project will be a six week trial with the option of a local agency continuing it if it is found to be successful. Miigwech. beautiful dancers and drummers, that's the Levi and relatives. Um, <clears throat> so communication is important, uh, an important part of the language and is often the first to go. So many of our communities have oral traditions. Uh, why aren't indigenous people speaking their own languages? I'm sorry, this is Ronnie. I just want to acknowledge the context here of me being a white man reading the words of uh, Indigenous respondents to the project here. So there's a lot of people saying our language is lost, our tradition is lost. No. Never say no when there's still hope in trying to be who you want to be and be strong with what you do, what you already know, and other people help you out. The elders and the young ones. Because we're happy and we have fun with each other and live that life thinking positive all the time, and you have fun doing different things, and tobaccos and medicines and sweet grass and sage, a lot of that's important, you know. And the situation where we come from, we couldn't even pick our own medicines in Riding Mountain because it was a national park. We were condemned from that life, and ever since that happened. Today on the reserve, we use our own minerals. We hunt on our own land. We pick our medicines on our own land. But you know, somebody with knowledge and education has got to know these things to be a leader and a helper and a caregiver to the young and the older. I went to memorials and feasts where I sang and I served. I listened to the elders. 
I listened to the young. I seen them dance. I seen their work with traditional makings of things. This involved feathers or ribbons, how to tie a ribbon or whatnot, where to tie it. What plants do you know and different things and different medicines that they use today? It's just, someone's got to do it, you know? And we're happy to have people around us that know how to do that. And we depend on that knowledge and we just tried to make the best of things as we could. For a lot of the illnesses that happened in the hospitals, traditional medicines can help with, just as well as foods. The soup kitchen, that's the reason I was getting interviews and I spoke about how traditional foods are served and what to cook and how to involve gardening or wild meat or whatever, fishing. It's something we did with our resources and we shared with communities and the people around us. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Ronnie, for that. So during the interviews, many men uh, shared about the connections that they had to Indigenous culture when they were children. These times, often spent with grandparents or community members, were spoken about with a smile and sometimes with a tear. Many men talked about a desire to reestablish those connections to culture and to the land. Ronnie suggests more music, arts, entertainment, cultural connections, planting food, and traditional medicines. For a number of interviewees, cultural connections, including smudging, help them to heal and walk a good path. Several interviewees express a desire to learn or relearn their indigenous languages. Frank wants to see more traditional people teaching. Newton also wants to see more cultural connections and suggests more stuff could happen at the park. Several other of our relatives were also keen on cultural programming, particularly for younger people. They felt this was a positive way to spend time and nurture community. For some folks, culture is what helped them to reduce or stop their substance use. In conjunction with the Men's Resource Center at John Howard Society, thanks Val, uh, Arch Brandon will be testing a men's cultural recreation project that will connect men to their culture, the land, and each other in healthy ways. Some of these activities include stickball, an early form of lacrosse, indigenous board games, indigenous language games and cards, snowshoeing, hoop dancing, moccasin game, leatherworking, stick and bone game, medicine gardening, fishing, soapstone carving, rattle making, horseshoes, bows and arrows, and more. Thank you, Darian. <clears throat> Next we have is Matilda. Um, how could this important cultural knowledge have been lost? And how the community connections been broken? Where's your spirit? At the res at the residential. I used to have long hair. That sister called me into the office and she grabbed my hair and chopped it off. Ever since then, I never liked having long hair. Did your siblings and parents go to residential schools as well? Hmm, um, right down to 73 to, or 70. Oh shoot, I forgot, in the 80s or 90s. Do you ever go to Fort Capel? I've never been, no, I don't, uh, don't think so, no. I used to see that hill. I used to know some kids were trying to run away and they were shooting them. They were shooting them? What were they shooting them with, guns? Yeah, that's where we were, that's where we go every summer to powwow. We'd pick sweetgrass, berries, and all those medicines. We'd bring them to Fort Capel and give them to the singers or the elders. Sometimes I go for a walk through the bush and go cry out there. Oh my God, um, if you're continuing that cycle, 100 years from now, you'll have the same stories. Thank you so much, Matilda. As a pre-teenager, I was abused by my father. He was an alcoholic and he was a drug addict. At that time, it was marijuana. So if he didn't get what he wanted, he'd take it out on us. From what I remember, he used residential tactics on us because he grew up in a residential school. So we'd be brushing and cleaning up the floor with toothbrushes, cleaning the floor with cloths, even though there was a mop in the closet. So we were abused in that way. 
He never sexually abused us. He never let anybody come around us and my brothers. Foster care got involved because I, want, I went to school and there was a counselor there and I told her about it. And, it was all, and I was always in trouble all the time. I was kind of troubled, I guess. So anyway, she got involved and we were in foster care for about two or three years until I was about seven years old. My father went to court and he fought to get us back. Get us back and we came back to the reserve because we were in foster care in Brandon. We went back and my father quit drinking. He recovered, but still he had anger problems. From then until about 16 or 17, we were still dealing with abuse, I guess. Emotional and verbal abuse. Not so much physical, well, here and there. When I was about 16 or 17, I went to go live with my grandparents from my mother's side. She lived not too far, honestly. It was the same reserve. Her parents were from there. I went there and stayed with them from about 17 until about 20. Between that time, they taught me all about being Dakota. They taught me about who I am and where I come from. They both passed away. I tried to stay there, but my aunties and uncles on that side wanted to be in control and all that. So anyway, from there, I stayed with my brother until about 21 or 22. Thank you so much, Marcel.
thank you for that. Deep roots that go far back. We saw residential schools for what they really were, even if others could not. We see it again, though, through the foster care system. A different looking head, but the same beast still praying underneath. Uh, Alyssa? I came back because our foster parents were abusing us. So we told the social worker and all that. For a long time, the social worker told us, we have no place to put you anywhere else. <clears throat> So we just lasted out, I guess. Then finally, our respite workers tried to adopt us to get away from our original foster parents, but they couldn't do it. So then we had to go back. Then they got caught for abusing us, so we went back to Sioux Valley. I don't know, I never really lived with my mom or was really close to her. My uncle works for Assiniboine Community College and he taught me everything I know about the native history, the whole native family tree and never date anyone from your reserve kind of thing. So, <clears throat> were you very connected with your culture growing up? Yes, very. I even had to do all the cultural things, like pick berries and pick all those root thingies for him. He had teach us everything. He taught us everything, even beading and the things we still do now. Did you do a lot of beading uh, yeah. while growing up? Yeah, I still do it now. Uh, what do you like to make? Keychains and earrings. Sweet. Well, it's a great thing to be proud of for sure. My girl, is there anything our people need? We need more life coaches. There was a lot of death in my family. My mom's dad died, then her two brothers died, and shortly after they killed each other, my sister died. And that's when my mom took off and just left me and my sister with her sister, who was my auntie. And she had a son who's a little bit older than us. And then she got that money from what happened to my sister when she got killed in that car accident when she was 13. We were only seven, I think. She left for Toronto. She took off and just left us. And we were raped, me and my sister, by my own cousin, who was a couple years older. So we went into foster care for a while. The first time we went to foster care was actually because we were left alone. We were really young, me, my sister, and my brother, probably five or six. It goes five, six, seven. But we burnt down the whole house. No one was home because my grandma was going through some issues. I like what you guys are doing here with these interviews. I appreciate it. You guys are pretty awesome. I want to do something like this one day. But I know I definitely have to work on myself first, and that's going to take Maybe not long, but I know that I'm losing my potential. Time is passing. I know I should have done this and done that. <clears throat> my girl, you're not the only one who struggled in foster care. This story has been going on for several generations. Thank you so much, Alyssa. I'm from Saint, um, I'm from Lake St. Martin, and it flooded in 2011. We were evacuated to Winnipeg. We were placed up at hotels, and some of us chose to live inside of the city at hotels, and some of us got a new house. When they built a lake, the new Lake St. Martin, I was kind of in between CFS and stuff like that. From the time I was 19 to 21, probably, I was almost homeless or really fighting it. But it was kind of like CFS didn't do transitions. They didn't have a proper transition system. And I just kind of had to do things on my own. Oh, miigwech. Welcome back, Darian. Okay, so 77 of our 102 interviewees were raised in part by somebody other than their biological parent or parents. Though the actual number is likely higher, 47 of those people chose to speak explicitly about being in foster care or group homes. For the, vast, for the vast majority of those people, their foster care experiences were not positive as they were forced to move frequently, often changing communities and schools. Many told stories about unsafe placements. Several of our relations spoke about leaving foster care to go to places that they perceived as being safer. A clear need for more safe, culturally appropriate foster parents, customary carers, and kinship carers was identified particularly in the community or school district of the children, so that the children don't have to leave their community and their school. Arch Brandon is going to trial an innovative way of seeking out and encouraging Indigenous people to consider becoming carers for our children. These beautiful cards have a picture drawn by Brian on the front. You might have actually seen these out in the foyer. Inside the card reads, I love the spirit in you. The next generation needs someone like you showing them the way. 
Have you considered becoming a deadly kinship, customary, respite, or foster family? Well, let's go then. If you are interested in becoming a kinship, customary, respite, or foster family, or would like to learn more, please contact one of the following child protection agencies listed within the cards. People will look around for Indigenous people that they know who they believe would provide quality love and care for foster kids and give them these cards to encourage them to consider becoming foster parents, kinship carers, or customary carers. These shoulder tapping cards will help Indigenous folks to encourage more people and the best qualified people they know to become the carers that our children so desperately need. It will also help empower our Indigenous people to choose who raises our children. Miigwech, Darian. The ability to choose is so important in our lives so that we can feel safe, comfortable, and at home. Why is it so difficult for our people to be able to find that in their lives? Hello, let's welcome Danette. 
Hi, my name is Susan Klein, and I'm here as a storyteller reading for a community member. I never once stayed at the shelter. I tried, but as soon as they would start grabbing me or trying to pat me down and shit, taking my shoes and stuff, I asked, is it my own free will to leave here? They were taking my shoes and all this shit. It just felt like a trap. I don't know. It just doesn't feel good anyways. I know a lot of people that can't stay there. It just completely feels like a trap. Like you're going to be stuck in a jail cell. And they didn't even tell you what was going on. They just started grabbing me and patting me down. I flipped out. I just went there three or four times because it was so cold and I was just wanting to check it out and find a warm place to stay. And I couldn't, I just couldn't do it. <clears throat> Sorry, there's um, quite a few women I know that have real hard times staying at shelter. It's not even that, it's the fire trauma for me. I know I've been in a lot of actual fires, house fires. Not having your own shoes, your own things to get running out, that's what scared the crap out of me. And being in a locked room, I just can't do it. Even now, we just had a fire. It was hard, eh? At the city center, it was hard, man. Everybody's been scared. I can't sleep now because I'm scared somebody's gonna burn down the building. Like, you know, because I'm a hard sleeper and I have to have someone there to sleep with me. Yeah, and you need to have those things when you're running outside, like your shoes and shit like that, especially in this weather. During the fire, it was freezing cold. The cops, the ambulance, the fire trucks, none of them cared if it was cold outside. They didn't even let us in their vehicles, and we were standing outside freezing at night. That makes you feel like you're nothing. Wow, does that ever play a number on your spirit? Thank you so much for telling Danette's story. Welcome back, Darian, for fire safety. Okay. So home fires need to be considered as a factor in homelessness in Brandon. I was pretty surprised uh, that 13 of our interviewees discussed one or more home fires as being part of their journey into homelessness. In addition, one interviewee talked specifically about how she had burned down her neighbor's house as a child. In addition to the obvious loss of a home and possessions, Danette spoke about the trauma that comes with home, uh, house fires. So, Arch Brandon is going to be organizing fire prevention and safety training for local indigenous fire keepers so that they can help us spread fire safety awareness in a culturally based way to indigenous people and folks who are homeless or precariously housed in Brandon. Arch Brandon will also support our indigenous fire keepers to test home fire prevention supplies that have been used to increase safety for other vulnerable communities across Canada so that no one else needs to lose their home. Thank you so much. That's amazing. Thank you, Darian. Um, <clears throat> sometimes people will surprise you um, how they come into homelessness. We have another story here who would like to remain anonymous, and we're going to get Jen to tell that story. At the time, I was living in South Indian Lake only went up to grade nine, so I had to go to Cranberry Portage School. I went to Winnipeg for university until I decided to go into nursing. I graduated nursing in 1998. I worked at Northern Nursing for 13 years until I burnt myself out and pretty much, yeah. That's another part of my story that has affected me in my life in the long term, especially with the way the Northern Nursing is. It's totally different from the trauma hospital you're pretty much it when you're up north. You're the doctor, you deliver the babies, you do the stitches, you do the x-rays, everything. I was basically working as a nurse practitioner there for a year in Nori House. When I encountered a lot, I would say lateral violence or violence in the workplace. I was pretty much burnt out by then. 
I was either going to leave or take care of myself and my well-being or freaking cause more trouble or death or something that would have took a toll on me. Because the thing that really took a toll on me was when I lost two of the youngest boys in the community, that 10 and 12. They both committed suicide a year apart. I think it's when it hit me. At the time, too, there was a lot of stress in my family. There were a lot of losses that took a toll on me. Plus, having to deal with chief and council, too. Having to follow their policies and guidelines, which they didn't follow anyways. Just kidding. With the care I was providing to the community, I just maintained following my code of ethics. As a nurse, I was abusing alcohol because it was a coping mechanism for me. And there was a lack of support from management and my work. And I just felt like there was nobody there to support me. I lost my passion for that because of the way I was being treated. Thank you so much, Jen, for that story. Thank you. Trauma can happen at any time to anyone, and in many different ways, it can change the direction of your journey and be held deep in your bones. Um, we're going to tell someone else's story through your eyes. My father was quite embarrassing at this time. He was a drinker with a gambling problem. He would take me out with him panhandling. It was a ploy. Basically, it would be like, if you don't give me money, this little boy isn't going to eat. He would do that to the parents of friends of mine when I was in kindergarten or grade one. He got my mom kicked out of the apartment we were in, and we moved from there to Clanboy. You know, that would have been where I grew up, at my grandparents' place. When we got there, my auntie, my mom's sister, was there too with her two kids, her son and daughter. I would have been about six years old. We couldn't stay inside because it was my grandfather's retirement home that he had built. It had a living room, a sunroom, a kitchen, and only two bedrooms, and one was supposed to be my grandpa's, and one was supposed to be my grandma's. So they both lived in the one bedroom, and my auntie lived in the other bedroom with her kids. So me and my mom lived in a small camper trailer thing that you pull behind a, tr a truck. And honestly, it was pretty good, actually, and I don't really complain about that. After she lost her job, my mom started to get really sick, and she was put in the Selkirk Hospital. She wasn't... I don't know what I'd call it, visibly native looking. But my grandparents, I remember them getting very mad because the medical staff were basically uh, treating my mom like some reserve Indian where they're with TB spreading TB to them. And she didn't even fucking have TB. They didn't know what she had. They weren't changing her bedding or whatever. It pissed my grandfather off to no end. Thank you so much. Um, it's funny how people perceive others based on their appearances, names, and the way they speak. In Canada, we are supposed to live without that prejudice, but sometimes it still seeps in. And we're going to get Daryl up here to read another anonymous story. Sorry, when I was Marcel. in Brandon Sorry. Correctional, I did a head count. 48 of us First Nations, five Caucasians, and one Mexican. That just blew me away. That's just bizarre. My entire life, I've seen nothing but, I wouldn't say racism, because that's a really tough word. And I was a part of it, being the color I am. Even though I'm indigenous, my skin is white. At 20 years old, I can remember running into the Friendship Center with a broom and hitting people with it and running away. It was just horrible. I've seen a lot of bad things. <clears throat> How is trying to talk to landlords and find an apartment? Again, because of my skin color, I got breaks. I got put on list ahead of other people of color, of First Nations, Blacks, Asians, or whatever. They bumped me right to the top. I applied for a job at the hospital. This was four years ago. They bumped me ahead, a list, ahead of a list of 164 people who are 
already waiting to be volunteers right to the top when it should have been the next volunteer. 164 people waiting and I jump right to the top. It's not right, but I can't change it or do anything when I apply for something. But it shouldn't matter what your skin color is, should it? Um, now we're gonna tell, uh, we're gonna bring out Alicia. Uh, she's gonna do a dance for us. Miigwech, Alicia. Next, we're going to be telling a story. Uh, his name's Alan, but we'll be looking through your eyes. It sucks being homeless in Brandon. There's some help out there, but not really that much. Because every place you apply to, it always says they want criminal background checks, and they want no one on employment income assistance. Some of them, well, most of them, are saying that they don't take the yellow EIA form. Well, that shouldn't stop you from getting housed, though, right? Right. Uh, that's another difficult one. But I know there's a few landlords out there or companies that still do accept them. So that's what I'm going to be doing today, trying to find another place to live. It is hard when you're homeless. Well, now it's easier than it was back when I was first homeless, because now there's 7th Street Health Access where you can go shower and wash your clothes and stuff. Before, there wasn't something like that. What about other places here in Brandon? The blue door is good when it's open. When it's open, people have somewhere to go. But what do you do for weekends and evenings, right? You don't really know where to go, and you can't be a beggar. 
they put these stupid bylaws in where you can't panhandle, you can't loiter, you always have to be going somewhere and doing something. You, you can't be hanging around anywhere. Um, how is finding homeless people uh, helping homeless people? Are there any other services you think are actually helpful or preventing homelessness? Well, rent assist is fucking awesome. I haven't ever had it, but I hear it's good. You know, I, I guess when you've got to keep up doing your taxes, it's up to you to get your GST, right? Well, they did have small things, but it wasn't nothing like how it is now or back then. There was no BNRC, right? And the Friendship Center can only help so much. So how do you feel about the places that do help you? Uh, you guys gave people rooms at the Colonial, got rid of Tent City down by the dip. There's only one or two people staying down there now. It's good that you guys helped the, give them rooms and stuff, but what if you weren't on EIA? That's why I didn't get a room or didn't apply for one, because I wasn't on EIA. You could probably tell me a lot about EIA, huh? Like I said, I just got back on two days ago. Every time I went to the provincial building to try to get back on EIA and ask for help, they said, oh, you missed a meeting, or your meeting was here. Every time I'd go for my intake, they'd say, I was late, or oh, it's tomorrow. Every freaking month they would say this, and every time I'd be on time to go to my intake, and when I had to meet my worker for my interview, they would always change the appointment on me. It seemed like there was always something blocking my way. Every meeting was always four weeks later, or three weeks later, or another four weeks, and something like that. It all added up to eight months not being able to get any help. Aren't they supposed to be there to help people? Can you think of anything that would have made that easier to get help right away? Yeah, meeting my worker right away would have been good. Maybe having a cell phone or something so that you can get a hold of them or communicate with them. Other than that, you got the library, which is good because they have computers that you can use. You can get help here in the city, and that's good to hear, but what about the reserve, my boy? How about your home community? Do you think they could better support their off-reserve members? Most definitely they can help, but they don't. Everyone I know that is from Sioux Valley that lives in Brandon, they don't get help from them. From their families, they do. If their uncle or auntie is a counselor or something, or they're the chief, then yeah, they get help. But if you're not related to them, they don't help you at all. Aren't chief and council supposed to be for all people, for all the people, not just their relatives? What do they need to do differently? A lot of things. I think they have a sub office here, but every time I go to the band sub office in Brandon, there never seems to be anybody there that can help you with anything. I need a status card. And every time I go there, Caroline's not in, or I don't know if she even does that anymore. I think somebody else does, but she's never in, or she's out of this, she's out of that, or basically can't fucking help you. And then if you don't have a status card or your provincial ID, then you're kind of screwed too. They can give away beds, right? That's what they could do. Or they can give vouchers or something for clothing or anything. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Thank you so much for sharing. I'm gonna bring Darian out for the cell phone project. Okay, so during our interviews, 12 interviewees identified the inability to access phones as a barrier to contacting landlords or connecting with services. While some agencies have access to phones as part of their programming, interviewees talked about waiting in line to use a phone, time limits on phone usage, and not being able to receive callbacks from potential landlords. Many interviewees also discussed safety, mental health, and physical health concerns that could require calling emergency services. Arch Brandon is going to test one possible solution to this problem by distributing 40 basic phones to Indigenous persons experiencing homelessness. These phones cost less than $30 each. People will receive a SIM card and a $15 phone credit. After one month, we will ask folks what they use their phone for. This will help us determine if access to a basic cell phone decreases barriers to services, including health, social services, rental units, or emergency services. We will also ask about whether the phone contributed to their safety in any way. This project will help us better understand who could benefit from having a cell phone and why. So uh, first of all, I'd just like to say welcome again. 
Uh, so what we use uh, tobacco for is for offerings. Uh, we use it for prayer. Uh, we uh, use it for uh, signs of respect. And, um, and not just for smoking. <laughs> but we do smoke it in a pipe. <laughs> uh, that'd be like a sacred tobacco. It's like Mother Earth tobacco. Uh, and we use that in ceremonies uh, for ceremonial pipe smoking and stuff like that. Uh, and then with the, the uh, medicines we use for smudging, is to purify our bodies, our souls, our minds, uh, our hearts. And so that's, uh, that's just a little teaching on those things. Uh, I thought I'd just share that with you before I get, to get into my story. Um, all right, well, I'm just going to share a little bit of my story with you, uh, how I grew up and where I am today. So, um, sorry, it's going to be a... It's going to be a little bit hard for me to explain some of these things. Uh, I got through so much hurt growing up. Uh, so just bear with me. Well, anyways, I, I, uh, at a young age, I uh, was taken away from my family. I was put into the system with uh, foster care. And uh, me and my younger sister uh, were taken into custody at a young age. I... Uh, I was uh, put in foster care, adopted out to a non-native family. I grew up in Ontario for most of my life, well, 17, maybe 20 years. Um, I had a pretty rough childhood. Um, I remember times I have to go picking my own sticks out of a wooden snow fence to have three of them hitting over my back, be punished. I used to get whipped by a, a belt 10 times. You know, that was my punishment all the time, you know. And, and having people tell me, you know, having people tell me they loved me, it really hurt me. Because my foster parents would hit me, they'd tell me, oh, we only punish you like this because we love you. So every time I got told I was loved, I would cringe out because I was waiting to be hit. Uh. So, you know, I'm not just, I'm very damaged on the inside. I am full of hurt. I still carry around a lot of pain. Um, you know, I, uh, it's, it's just a lot to carry. It's a lot to hold in. And, uh, you know, I, I growing up at the age of 14, I left home. I never returned. And even to this day, I still don't talk to my foster parents or my adopted parents. Um, you know, and I left my sister behind. And uh, she ended up leaving home at an early age, too. And then, uh, you know, and at the age of 14 is when I became homeless. I left home, I packed my bags, and never went back. I did stay in school. And uh, I ended up going into, uh, back on the streets for a little while. You know, and, and being at the age of 14, you know, I'm a young man, just still a kid. You know, I, I learned to uh, take care of myself on the streets. You know, whether it's digging in garbage cans for something to eat or, you know, panhandling, asking for change or something or whatever, you know. So it, it, life got a little rough for me. It, it really did. And I didn't know anything about my... Uh, Native background, about my heritage or anything. All I was told is growing up as uh, of a North American native. Uh, I'm a Minto Dakota Sioux, by the way. Proud of it. Um, 
So uh, yes, I left home and uh, I'm going to the streets. Uh, I stayed in high school as long as I could. And then, uh, uh, of course, you know, uh, being running with the wrong crowds and everything like that, I, uh, you know, got into drinking a lot, you know, got into drugs, doing drugs and alcohol, you know, just doing whatever kids do. Uh, you know, then and following with all that, you know, of course I got into trouble, you know. Like when I, I didn't know any better, you know, I thought I was like one of the cool kids that I go follow their footsteps and go and get shit with them or whatever, or trouble, sorry. And uh, yeah, you know, I ended up going to jail a few times. My first bit as a, as a, uh, a young offender, I think I was probably about 15. I think I got my first bit was a year for stealing a car and a couple of vehicles or whatever, you know. And so my life carried on with that. And I just kept doing all these bad things I wasn't supposed to do. And I had nobody to look up to, nobody to tell me any different anymore. So and then uh, probably about, about 16 years of age, I uh, ended up in, a, in foster care again. But I kept telling them, I said, if I'm going back to another home that's uh, abusive, I'm not going to stay. I'll go back to the streets. And uh, so I went into a, um, a foster home with uh, Native people. So I felt comfortable this time. So they took me in. They, let, they raised me after that, almost up until I was about 20 years old. So, uh, you know, I had a new family. I called them mom and dad and loved them very much. You know, I gained some new brothers and a new sister and everything. And, you know, it was my family for a while. And then uh, I am um, get uh, growing up a little older, had kids of my own. Uh, I never had a chance to raise all my kids, but you know I do know them. You know, and I have one of my sons here today with me. Uh, so I, I have six kids. I have a couple of girls and some boys. Uh, yeah, so you know, uh, I grew up in this system. It's it's uh, not a fun place to be, either being in a foster home or in, in jail or you know, I ended up myself in prison a while back, like quite a few years ago. Uh, you know, and it's just something now. I just when I finally realized that, you know, I just got into my native culture, learning things, you know, learning uh, my teachings. I'm learning as I go. You know, and I, I uh, got my spirit names. Like, uh, my first one's like Hawk Warrior Blue Sky. That's, uh, I was given that name because I was, um, well, what they tell me is I'm, I'm, some, uh, I'm a leader of some sort because I actually go out and do things. And, you know, and uh, I, I'll, I'll go out there and talk to people. And, uh, uh, as you know, if I see somebody that's in, in a, a bad spot or something, you know, I offer them a hug all the time, you know. So I know how it feels not to be like be out there alone, not have nobody sometimes, you know. But there's always somebody there, you know. So I offer my uh, I offer my comfort. So yeah, so that's what my first spirit name means is that um, I, um, like, you know, I'm a warrior that I'll stand up for myself. I'll stand up what's for what's right. <sighs> Um, and my second spirit name is Wolf Medicine, which was, uh, I'm still trying to figure out why I was given this name, but <laughs> uh, what they tell me is why they, I, I was chosen to have this name, was given this name is because I'm supposed to become a spiritual healer. Because I, I, uh, I, I chose to take the path of uh, healing myself, going on a, on a journey to to heal myself and heal others as I go. You know, hopefully I, I, I show, I show the strength for others that don't have it. You know, when I, when I pray, I pray for other people that are struggling in the streets. And I pray with my heart. I pray for them every day that they have their strength to carry on with their lives, that they all get out of this struggle. You know, whether it's with, with the alcohol, with the drugs, being homeless, you know, everybody that is homeless, you're not alone. I've been there. 
I was right beside you sometimes. But, uh, you know, and then I also pray hard and I pray. I pray for each and every one of you. When you don't have your strength, I pray to be your strength. I pray for that every day. At times it takes a lot of emotion out of me. It drains me physically, emotionally, spiritually, because it's a lot to take on for me to do this. But I do because I love you. And a lot of you here, I do know you. And I'm not afraid to say it. I love you. <laughs> you know, if I had a, I've had rough times being homeless myself. You know, always couch surfing. You know, knocking on people's doors, letting me in because it's cold out. You know, sometimes my own family might not be there for me, but uh, you know, other people might be. So you know, I know how it is. I know how it feels. You know, I just uh, recently got my own place. I got, I, you know, I have a fantastic job. I, I work with the, the Ask Anti program, you know, fantastic people. I love all of you. You know, but they gave me a second chance. They gave me a second chance in life, and I thank you so much for that. You know, now that I have my own place, I have my feet, I'm back on my feet again. You know, I'm still having a difficult time going on my journey. But you know, I don't look at anybody else that's homeless or having a hard time. I don't turn my back to you. And I won't. You know, we were friends before we were on the streets, before we were on the streets, or even after we were on the streets. But you know, you're still my family, street family, blood family whatever, but we are family still, you know. And I always carry every one of you in my heart. But you know what? I'll never turn my backs on you. If anything, I'll come with you, open arms, I'll give you a handshake, I'll ask you how you're doing. If I have to give you the shirt off my own back, I'll do that. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I uh, kind of just lost for words right now. Uh, uh, yes, I'm uh, in the. I'm still in the transformation of still finding myself. Still, you know, I've I've just been able to uh, open up a little more every day as uh, as days go on. You know, I didn't know how to cry before. I used to hold everything in. And now I know how to open my heart and I know how to feel. I know how to feel pain. I know how to cry. And then, you know, I never used to be able to do this in front of anybody. And it, uh, it feels really nice to be able to open up in front of a bunch of people. People that I know, family, strangers. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I just, I just pray every day for strength. You know, I carry this medicine bag with me because you know it's, it's been blessed. It's, it's, this is my, this is my strength. And uh, saying all that, uh, I believe in these medicines. You know, I believe in these, these drums. I believe in everything that's, that's, that's going to help me on my journey. And uh, I'd just like to share it with my, my uh, second spirit name being Wolf Medicine. That, like I said, it was given to me because I'm supposed to become a spiritual healer to help people heal and help everybody on their journey, on their healing path. Like, I won't ever be a medicine man or anything like that, but you know what? I'm just here to help people that are in need. And uh, 
So, you know, and I, I make these little medicine bags. I've handed out a few to some people. But you know what? When you are ready to have it, that's when I can give it to you. But uh, you can feel free to come and talk to me anytime you want. I uh, will not tell anybody else what we ever talk about. But I'm here to help anybody that wants to be healed, uh, help on that healing journey. And that's, uh, well, that's just a little bit of my story I wanted to share with you. Thank you. Miigwech. Thank you so much for that. <clears throat> to be seen, uh, to be loved, sometimes it goes deeper than that. Our people stay alive even through the most heartbreaking of things. They are so resilient. We have uh, Marcel here to tell uh, Louis' story. Louis. I lived in the North Shore Mountains on the mainland of British Columbia. I was always in the mountains. I came down to the prairies here because I got addicted to opiates when I was young. <clears throat> you do what you gotta do. Um, how did that start? I broke my arm in two spots. My right arm. And the doctor then started giving me 10 T3s a day, which started my opiate dependency. I was only 12. And then, when they started to not work, the, the doctor upgraded me to Percocet and then Oxycodone and then morphine. Next thing you know, I'm doing heroin at the age of 14. Wow. Well, that's partially because of my sister. She gave me my first puff of heroin when I had just turned 14 and it grabbed a hold of me deadly, just my sister and myself. I stayed on the island for quite some time until I went to the penitentiary, penitentiary when I was 18. I got charged with aggravated armed robbery with violence because I was high on crack. I had no more money for crack so I went and robbed a gas station. I started out just wanting to get their money and run away, but then the clerk, for whatever reason, laughed at me, and I don't know what made me snap. I said, if you laugh at me, you don't give me the money, and you laugh at me again, I'm going to stab you. And he laughed at me again, and I stabbed that man. I got sentenced to 10 years. I served seven out of the 10 years, in William Head Penitentiary, I moved to the North Shore in British Columbia because the victim's family was a fairly large family. Some years after I went to jail, I wrote an apology letter to the man, and he wrote back and said, I forgive you. So that was pretty good, you know. It wasn't safe then. I guess you could say, because when the family, when they let me out of jail, the family made threats to kill me. And they tried a couple of times. I went to the North Shore Mountains and found my way from the mountains down into the city of Vancouver, down into East Hastings. I don't know if you know much about East Hastings or heard much about it, but it's the second deadliest low income or poor homeless, poor person area in Canada. The first one's in Ontario in Toronto. I've seen some pretty deadly stuff down there, you know. My first night down in East Hastings, I stayed at the Salvation Army Hostel. The next morning, I got up, went outside to have a smoke, and seen this lady sitting by a dumpster. Sitting there, leaning up against a dumpster, and the sun was coming up. I sat down there beside her. I was talking to her. I said, would you like a coffee or something? And she didn't say anything. And then I said, 
well, you know, you don't have to be rude. You could have answered me, you know. Turns out she was dead. She sat there and she overdosed. I had no idea. Her eyes were open and the sun coming up. It just looked like she was enjoying the sunrise. Turns out the whole time I was talking to that lady, but she was dead. <clears throat> what about your family through all of this? My mom and dad got scared that I was going to overdose on heroin or, heroin or die because I had seven overdoses. My dad got scared and he said, you're moving down to your aunt's house or to your cousin's house in service. I said, like fuck I am. He said, you have no choice. In our family, when the parents spoke or if my dad said something or if my mom said something, you didn't argue. You just had to do it. He packed me up and he sent me on a three-day bus trip down to Cirrus to my cousin's house. And let me tell you what, Cirrus is just a little town, but very racist. You know, I didn't come from a racist family, and then to experience racism down here meant I was always fighting people and doing my thing. My mom is from, from the Haida Gwaii First Nation in British Columbia. I've been there, but I love hearing it from people's perspectives. What's it like to you? It's in the Queen Charlotte Islands, which is beautiful and well protected. Beautiful trees and mountains and oceans. It's just gorgeous there. It's untouched. It's basically living as a bush person. Out there, you They got their little grass huts everywhere. My mom was a scary woman. She, she believed in God. She read the Bible and she went to church. And if you got out of hand and that, that Bible came out, two things are gonna happen. You're getting a lecture about God and why you're not believing in him to make your life better, or you get the Bible beats. My mom would hit you with a Bible. I'm not talking like taps. I mean, she'd full on hit you. And that was a good three inches thick. And yeah, that Bible hurt, let me tell you. And when my mom pulled that Bible, even my dad would run. Yep. My dad was a 280 pound biker. When my mom pulled out that Bible, he ran like a little kid. How are your parents now and your sister, if you don't mind me asking? I really don't know too much. I haven't had a whole lot to do with my mom over the last so many years. My sister, she passed away in 2015 of AIDS. She got AIDS from sharing a needle with this girl in BC and this girl didn't know she had it. And so my sister got it. She was in the end, she was in the end of stage three. That pain and everything was so bad that my sister took her own life. Just to get away from the pain, she wasn't very old either. She was young. I said, what's the matter? She said, bro, this kind of pain, there's no prescription drug that can kill it. My dad passed away in 2013 from emphysema. Well, the part I didn't get to the part I kind of skipped. I got married when I was 16 years old. My dad had to go to the town hall. The town hall to sign papers for me to marry this woman. She was 16. Her parents had to sign the thing. We ended up having six kids together and then she was hit and killed by a drunk driver. Her and my daughter were hit and killed on Douglas, Douglas Street in Victoria, right in front of Smitty's restaurant. My daughter was only six years old. I turned around just as they got mowed down, which caused me to go off the deep end. When the driver of the vehicle that hit them stopped, I dragged them out of the vehicle and I almost beat him to death beside the road. 
when I was done hitting him, they dragged me pretty good. They drugged me pretty good because of my anger. A couple days later, when I started coming to, my hands hurt so bad. I was like, what happened? The nurse said, you broke every bone in your hand hitting the guy beside the road. I just unleashed hell upon him. And the guy's mentally challenged now and for life, but he still went to jail, to a special unit. He got released from jail here a few years ago, and that's why I've never gone home. That anger never, that anger's never gonna go away. I'm just a bitter, angry person though. You've had so much loss, so much grief, eh? Some trauma never heals. It's like I'm in hell, but I'm just waiting for the devil to open the door and say, come on in, man. That's why I do drugs. I'm a hardcore meth addict, but I'm a meth addict with a heart. I don't go and steal your shit. I don't go break into people's houses or garages and steal bikes and all that kind of shit. If I don't have money for drugs, I'm drug sick. I stay like that until I get money for drugs. So it's like a vicious cycle. You get money, you get high, you feel like shit. You get money, you get high, you feel like shit. It's the same. It's a revolving door and because I'm a drug addict, a lot of places and landlords in this town won't rent to me. It's been hard because as soon as they see me, I look like a drug addict. There's no two ways about it. I know I look like a drug addict, but, at, but the places I've lived, I kept them. It's been quiet and I've kept the place clean. So if I smoke meth, I don't do it around the house. If they say no smoking, no drugs, no drinking or whatever, I go someplace else and do it. My body depends on meth so bad every day. Then when I don't have it, I don't get up. I just lay there and sleep. I just lay there and feel worse and worse and worse. I smoke probably half an ounce of meth a day. And a lot of that reason is to keep myself numb out from all the bad shit that's going on in my life. I don't want to deal with that no more. I don't want to think about it. Because every time I sober up, when all the memories of my wife and daughter come floating back, and that man I stabbed when I was 18, my dad passing away, and when I smoke meth, it just makes me numb. I don't feel nothing. It just makes me feel better. And then, because of my drug use and being a drug addict, then I have to experience homelessness. If I had my way, if I was a millionaire or, what I, or whatever, then I'd be like Patch Adams. I'd have a homeless shelter, but not your average treatment center. A lot of people that are coming off heroin or, or meth smoke weed because it helps with the cravings. When you smoke a joint, you forget about getting high or on meth, or you forget about the down part. I'd supply that kind of thing to my patients. But if you don't want to smoke, it's fine. Or if you can't smoke it, but you still want to try it, then there's still, then there's drops for this, or there's butters and edibles. So you, <clears throat> you're finding when you have access to pot, you're less likely to do meth? Yeah, when I have access to pot, my crystal meth consumption goes down rapidly. So how much pot is required in order to successfully reduce the meth cravings? Well, for me, when I smoke a joint, I give half, I have half a joint and the cravings are gone for about four to six hours at least. As you smoke weed, your tolerance level goes up. To have access to a gram of weed a day would be huge because every time I get a craving, then I'll have a couple puffs. Right, just to settle that craving down. So do you have a preference in terms of meth cravings? If it's smoked, if it's edibles, if it's oils, or if it's creams? Does it make a difference in how you consume it? Well, yeah. When you smoke it, you get a certain kind of high. If you get edibles, 
you get what they call a body stone. I was wondering if one kind is better for suppressing the meth cravings. Well, for the pain, when you come off of meth, all your nerves come alive. Everything comes alive again, and it hurts. So a body stone where you eat a couple edibles is good. But I find smoking a joint messes up my brain, and it just tells me that I don't need meth. All I think about is food. So instead of needing meth, you focus on food if you smoke it? That's fascinating. Yeah. My sister was the same way. My sister was a hardcore heroin addict for most of her life. So it helps with heroin too, not just meth? It helps with heroin too. Coming off opiates is the worst detox you can imagine because of the bone pain and the nerve pain. It just makes you slither and you scream and you cry and you just wish for someone to shoot you. Is the body stone better for that? Yeah, the body stone. It sort of takes the pain down a little bit. The CBD part, that's what you need. That's what I was going to ask. The THC CBD balance makes a big difference. It does. So you're saying CBD is more important for the body pain? Some pot has high CBD content and moderate THC content. So when you're coming off drugs, you don't want to eat but pot will make you want to eat it? I don't think I've met five people in the last 25 years that pot has not given them the munchies. I guess if you're losing weight and stuff, then being able to eat is really important. It is actually, because I can eat a full-size burger and fries from Boston Pizza in 20 minutes or half an hour later, and in half an hour later, it's like I haven't eaten nothing. My body is starving all the time, so when it gets something, it consumes it so quickly that you're still hungry. For the first few days for me, when I'm coming off the drugs, I just want to sleep. So you do indica then? Yeah. So you go for indica, something that makes you drowsy and knocks you out. Then after a week, when you start feeling a bit better, you switch over. to sativa because I don't want to spend all of my time sleeping. My own decisions in life have led me to the point of where I'm at now. My granny used to tell me that every man and woman are dealt a deck of cards in life. How you play them is how your life is going to turn out. Well, I played them the wrong way and I got a shitty hand. So this is what happens. Homelessness, drug addiction, you know? Sometimes I look for ways to go to jail, even if it's just for 30 days, just to get away from everything, the people, the city, to get my head on straight again. But I'm 41 years old now. I've had enough of this lifestyle for, da for damn sure. But the devil, he's got his hooks in, on me with meth. I'm not shitting you. He got a hold of me and said, you're mine now for life. And do you find that pot helps you to be calmer? Oh yeah. Coming off drugs, I guess from all the things that gone on in my life, I'm an angry person. I have a lot of hostility and anger built up. I'm just angry all the time. And with the weed, I go from raging, break everything in sight, mad, to smoking up, try and be calm, laughing and joking around with people. My dad used to say, son, you should do nothing but smoke weed. You're way better to be around. When you're on that damn meth shit, you're an, you're an asshole, my dad said. I'm a big guy, and you know what I do for a living. But you scare me sometime. What are your thoughts about drug treatment? Well, when people come into treatment, I don't believe in the cold turkey thing. It's bullshit. That is the worst thing you could do to an addict, no matter who it is. When they come into treatment, give them a bag of meth. Just monitor, monitor how much and give them a certain amount. So it would help to wean people down then? It's kind of like giving someone methadone for heroin addiction, right? 
you find out how much they're taken off of heroin or whatever, you start them off on a certain dose and you slowly cut them down over time. The reason for that is it slowly weans your body off it. Then the withdrawals aren't nowhere near as bad. But most people go into detox treatment, end up failing within the first two or three days. Because they're coming off of it. Their body is screaming for it. They haven't, they, they just have enough of the pain and everything going on. So they say, fuck it. And they leave to go get high. You know, it sounds kind of stupid to giving people drugs when they're coming off of drugs. I always thought that when I was younger until I got to experience drug addiction myself. Since then, I have a different perspective. Thank you so much. So Brennan and Louis presented an idea for a harm reduction project to help people use less meth and opioids. They suggested providing people with legal marijuana while they navigate some of the barriers to housing. In partnership with healthcare providers, Arch Brandon will be testing the impact that the use of marijuana has on street drug consumption, overdoses, health, involvement in the justice system, and housing status. So is there something that's missing that would be helpful for you that we don't have in Brandon? Uh, the Bear Clan should start giving smokes or joints away. Weed. That's what I think. I don't see why they don't. Do you think it would help with buying of street drugs if people have pot? How come you think it would be good to hand out pot? Because it's legal. It relieves the stress. Uh, it relieves the stress. Yes, that's right. Then people wouldn't be in trouble with the law if they had pot that was handed out. Relaxes you, chills you out. You think weed would help calm people? Yeah, weed is good. And it's legal. That's interesting. If you were the person setting that up, how would you make that happen? Like, where would they get it? Or how would you distribute it? Like the Bear Clan. They should start giving out pre-rolled joints. Oh yeah, the pre-rolled pre ones, because it would be easier to hand out? Yeah, because a lot of people downtown would be interested in that. Thank you so much. Sometimes the family you have are the ones you make. They come from all different places. Tiny bus shacks and encampments, and why not let them make their own family? Sometimes they're better than the ones they are born with. Now we're gonna tell a story through, I believe it's, this person wants to remain anonymous. Hello. I was curious why people spend time in front of bus shacks in Winnipeg. Right in front of the Hudson's Bay store, there's a bus shack, and I was going there. I'm waiting for my bus. There's an old guy sitting in the corner talking. There's a guy standing there who said, hey, bro, hey, sister, come here. And I went over. He shook my hand. Can you close that door? The old guy says, I've got cold feet. I've got no socks, he told me, and it was winter time. The first guy came back in and he, to the bus shack and he said, hey sister, thank you so much. You're welcome here anytime. Yeah, I told him. I used to wonder why, what you guys do. You know what, sister, he said? We help out each other. We as Aboriginal people, I'll give anything to my brother. I'll do anything to help him out. And you know what, he says? We like living in bus shacks. And no offense, but there was a woman, a white woman, standing outside. 
<clears throat> she made us look like we had nothing. She's putting us down. The guy walked up to her and he said, you know, why don't you stop staring at us? He said, if you think we're poor, we're not poor. We want to be in here because we don't have a home. Oh, that woman just turned and walked, walked away. <clears throat> And don't ever come back if you want to know. We have money. We're not poor like you think. You're putting us down, he told her. And that woman just walked away. Then there's a woman coming across the way. And I was looking at her. She's coming right up to where we were. She opens the door and she had this big cart. I thought she was a bag lady. Oh my God, I couldn't believe this. She opens the door. Hey, my bros and sisters, I'm back, she says. The guy in the corner said, I want some fucking socks. I got cold feet. I've had no socks all day. Well, bro, you're in luck, she says. And what does she do? She goes to the cart. She had a bunch of meat and batteries for that one guy, and she was rolling papers. She had socks and everything that everybody wanted. She had everything for everybody. Thank you so much. Now we're gonna be talking about the woman's safe house.
Miigwech. I have Darian with Women's Safe House. So throughout these interviews, many women told us about the particular challenges faced by unhoused women and the need for safe spaces for homeless women. The vast majority of women st spoke about safety concerns during their interview, including abuse and neglect as children, sexual abuse and exploitation, physical assaults, unsafe housing, and violence. Many women highlighted the need for safe spaces, safe support of people, and safe activities. During the interviews, a particular concern was expressed about the safety of our young women that are aging out of care and our older women who are extremely vulnerable. Esther dreamed of a safe home that welcomed homeless people. She said, I look at these homeless people, and I told my son about a month ago, you know, we should get a place, a four, five, six bedroom place, and you know what? We'll call it Esther's home for homeless people. During her interview, Crystal explained her vision. I know they have the women's shelter, but maybe if they had one just for Native women, because there's so many murdered and missing Indigenous women, just for Native women, doesn't necessarily have to be for abused women that come out of the home, like for women that just feel that they have nowhere to go, not because they are being abused, because that's what that place is open for just because they feel alone and nowhere to go and nobody there to go to, to have a place like that. You know, if they could just go there and speak to someone that may direct them, maybe somebody who's been through the same thing. I don't know, I really don't know. But I know that maybe if there was a place like that, what I'm saying, a native shelter for women, where somebody could help them find a place or get off the street or maybe put them together. Jacinta's recommendation was more safe spots like where you can go and just enjoy a cup of coffee and not have to worry about anything for a minute. Talk it through with somebody that's also been through what you've been through, but not quite the same, but they understand a little bit. It's nice to have that. Brandy said that she wishes we had a shelter for just women, not a co-ed shelter. I've never stayed at Safe and Warm because I don't trust it. Yeah, so if I don't have nowhere to sleep, I just end up wandering the streets. Another relative was concerned about women either having to stay in an unsafe place or to go back to jail when they have a court order. She said, a lot of the girls that I met in jail are back in jail because we have nowhere to go. They release us to this house and under court order and you have to live there. If you move, you have to get approved by the courts. And every time you get into a fight with that person, they phone the cops on you and you're back in jail. It's a vicious cycle. Michelle was particularly concerned about safe places for youth aging out of CFS. Jace wanted a 24-hour place for folks to sleep and shower, while Lester Lynn suggested transitional housing. Arch Brandon has heard our Indigenous women, and we will be opening a six-month trial women's safe house in May. One of the first women to talk... One of the first women to talk about the women's safety and the need for women to gather, to share, and to do art together was Chelsea. <clears throat> In honor of her life and her ideas, this women's safe house will be called Chelsea's. This home will prioritize women's safety and the seven teachings. This home will be filled with indigenous culture, food, laughter, music, learning, stories, and healing based on the ideas and advice given to us by our relatives during the interviews. Many of our sisters and aunties wanted more indigenous culture, including Pam, who suggested powwow music. Veltina wanted hobbies, talking with people, and a place to store things. Some of our relatives, including Kelsey and Tasha, thought people needed more activities, recreation, and things to do. Danette, Olga, Melissa, and several other relatives suggested an opportunity for folks to learn how to care for a home, how to manage their money, and other life skills. 
Several of our relatives, including Alyssa, suggested life coaches, while Jacinta called for a safe spot with people with lived experience to talk to. We have gathered a group of wise and willing women to move into this house and turn it into a loving and welcoming home for the young women who will join them in the months to come. As these wise women continue on their own healing journey, they will be the mentors, the aunties, and the teachers for our younger women. As women spread their healed wings and fly, more women will be welcomed into this safe nest. Sometimes things... Thank you so much. Sometimes things will get worse before they get better. Sometimes survival is the only way out of things you've been dealt with. This next story is going to be anonymous. I was born and raised in Thompson, Manitoba. I was raised in a community called South Indian Lake. Opipanawatan Cree Nation is our reserve name. It really wasn't. We weren't band members with them. We were band members with Nelson House. Nisachawayasik Cree Nation before we became our own reserve. No, we first lived in a three bedroom, right? But I remember growing up, we had to move from place to place because we didn't have accommodations. It was not anything safe. It was not anything compared to safe. We were always cold, but we were always hungry, and that was when I was young. We literally had to take care of each other and ourselves. Our parents were working, or whatever. My father was an alcoholic. My mother was a Christian. She looked after us. She had 11 of us. That's a lot of children to look after by herself. And we looked after each other, and that's how we grew up. They both went to residential school. My mom was not treated wrongfully, but my dad was. So we had different ways. Like my mom was not treated wrong and my dad was. So there was always some sort of involvement with Christianity. I myself, I'm a Christian. I believe that people deserve good in their life. People need that love and need to be respected, no matter what. I moved out of my reserve, or out of town before it became a reserve, and I moved to Brandon when I was 15 years old. I mainly moved because of school. I have a lot of trauma, and I was molested as a child, and it kept on happening and until, until I realized no one could do nothing about it. So that's the reason why I moved. I was staying with a room and board, like a housing family. They got paid to look after me from Brandon School Division. Yeah, they were paid to make sure that I went to school and I had a place, accommodations. It was like a paid room and board, but it was like a foster care. I don't know what to call it. I don't know what they were called, so they were just responsible adults that had jobs and were able to look after a child, right? A child's right to go to school. School is my place to go. It was my, I don't know, like there's people there. No one could hurt me. No one could touch me. And that was my go-to place. I decided that education was my key to leave, but that did not help. I didn't have no resources. I didn't have no one to talk to. I ended up using alcohol as a coping mechanism, and I am an alcoholic to this day. I have been counseled throughout my whole life. I have been asking for help as much as I could. I got my little sister out when she was 15 for my community. She got molested by the same motherfucker that molested me when I was a child, and I got her out of there. She wasn't doing good at school, but she was living with me, and we both experienced homelessness together. I was of age, but she wasn't. And then we had to go to the YMCA, or Meredith's place, in the family area. And I was working, and I was trying to go to school at the same time, and getting her to school at the same time was very difficult. 
right? So that's where I first experienced homelessness. I would like to stay somewhere where I could get an ed education without the interference of anybody trying to hold me back or where I don't have to be there for everyone because I would like to be there for me and my son. I would like my son to grow up in a better environment. I was homeless because that's why I'm writing to Manitoba Housing right now. They don't get a place because I owed, I owed them a month's rent and now they're sending it to the government. And that's one of the reasons why I'm doing this survey with you because of the homelessness. Because I got subsidized housing when I was in Killarney and it was like very low rent and that was okay. I was able to keep up with my rent because I'm a single parent. I don't get help from my son's dad, nothing whatsoever. Even if EIA asks him to help me, he has no job. He does, it under the, he does work under the table, but he's just a deadbeat motherfucker living with his mom. He's like just one of those guys and I'm not going, and he's not going to help me or my son get his education or anything. It's ridiculous. I don't know what to do about that. I can't do anything about that, but that's why I want to speak up about it. It doesn't make sense to me at all. Thank you so much. I am one of these people too. I am also a person that has been homeless many, many times in their life. I'm gonna share a little bit about my story. Um, I am two-spirited. I am a First Nations on my dad's side and I'm a Métis on my mom's side. We come from Duck Bay, Manitoba and Pine Creek. Um, I started off in Dauphin, Manitoba, um, trying to go to school, but getting into trouble along the way. Um, as I was moving forward and going to school, I noticed discrimination and I noticed a lot of um, hate towards somebody that was like myself. And um, I didn't, I didn't realize that um, at first when I started off um, going through in life, I didn't realize that I could make a change within myself. All I knew was uh, violence, all I knew was hate, all I knew was uh, doing criminal activities. So I ended up doing that at a young age and going to jail and um, experiencing a lot of um, family members not wanting me to stay at their place because I was such a horrible person. Um, so at 16 years old, I started to figure out ways to try and make my money and try to live and eat. And um, it led me to the streets of Winnipeg and I started to sell my body and become a street worker. Um, it's very emotional and very, um, it still affects me to this day. I didn't think that it would in some cases, but when you think about it and when you relive those memories, you kind of um, have a lot of pain and regret. Turned 18, it was too late. I was already stuck in a cycle for two years of doing drugs and selling my body and being homeless, going back to the street on Higgins, back and forth. Um, constantly trying to support myself, having no help from any agency. There was nothing out, out in the community. Uh, I tried to reach out to various places to try for help. That There was nowhere, especially for someone that was two-spirited or trans. There was nowhere to turn. Um, there was no housing facilities, nothing. You basically had to just live on your own or struggle going to sleeping in bathrooms or going to the YMCA at the time to shower to keep clean. 
losing your, using your last money for that or just figuring out ways. I didn't have any friends in Winnipeg. So um, I decided to continue doing this lifestyle for years and it led me down a path of destruction. I was addicted to crack and meth and started to go downhill pretty quick. I didn't realize that I was intelligent at the time because nobody ever told nobody ever told me that I was intelligent when I was younger. Um, I didn't realize that I had good grades when I was in school. I didn't realize that I could do something and be a be somebody. I didn't realize that I can, you know, be a lawyer or a doctor because that wasn't on the table for us being indigenous and being also a trans person and a family full of abuse. Um, I didn't see that for myself. So I went on many, many years just thinking this is my life, being um, a hooker uh, on Main Street. Uh, that's basically what my life was at the time um, until um, I think I was in my early 20s and I was throwing up black stuff and I was really, really sick from the drugs and this lady with long gray hair came up to me and she said to me, what is a beautiful thing like you doing in a street like this? And I said, um, I'm going to be okay. She goes, are you? And I was like, yes, I'm going to be okay. I'm fine because I was throwing up. And it took one person to say something really nice to me. And I felt like because my family wasn't there, nobody was there for me. Nobody tried to check up on me or anything because I was such a nuisance. And um, I felt that somebody's there for me. And I always take these cues from the universe, you know, something to show that, you know, you could there's somebody always watching you or somebody that loves you, right? So I took that, those ladies' words, like, what is a beautiful thing like you doing in a place like this? Like, like standing there, I was standing there puking, throwing up on, in Winnipeg, and I didn't see myself as beautiful, and it's still hard to see myself as beautiful, you know? And I didn't, like, inside or out or anything, I didn't see myself as anything, because I always was told that I'm just always going to be a, a hooker working on the streets or an ugly tranny or fag or whatever, you know, the words they use and part of my language, I don't want to offend anybody as well. Um, so I took, took what she said and I tried to do something with myself, failed, failed over and over again, um, was still on the street and still kept doing the things that I was, was doing and then um, I tried everything. I tried Western society way, the, the, the way of what they were trying to, I tried to do AA, I took um, anger management, it didn't work. I tried to continue to go to places that would help me and nothing worked. And one day I seen, um, I went to a round dance at the Forks and I met an elder there and I had, I wanted to talk to him about certain things and again, um, I was kind of feeling defeated because um, back then and even still now today in some circles, because I'm trans, um, I was told back then like I, to reach out and get help, but don't wear the ribbon skirt, wear, in your, wear your male clothing. And so that threw me off, but I didn't let that stop me. I went to more elders, different elders that were, that had different teachings and um, I started to go by my culture. Uh, don't get me wrong, though. I'm um, I'm not a saint. I'm not a a perfect person. I'm a broken person, and I continue to strive to be better every single day. I went to school from there. Started to go to ceremonies. I've been through 31 sweats now, and I've been through um, uh, a lot of healing and crying and struggling, and I still struggle today. Um, I went and got my mature student in 2015, and then 2016 I got my first uh, year of computer applications of business certificate. Then I got my computer applications of business second year of um, uh, my diploma in 2018. 
Then 2019, I took a break. I started working at the Manitoba Métis Federation and started to get housing for myself and um, still kind of struggled with my anger. Um, so I needed to leave that job. And then 2020, COVID hit hard and I was still doing my schooling. I didn't want to quit. I didn't want to let anything um, put me down or keep me from reaching my goals. And um, so I finished my first year of business administration. And in all those years, um, believe it or not, I was top of my class with a GPA of 4.11. And I didn't, thank you, I didn't, I won awards, I got accolades and all that. And you know, I still feel like I'm not worthy of it. I'm still, I still feel like that because all, the years people telling me, You're, you ain't shit, you ain't gonna be nothing, you ain't gonna amount to nothing, you know, nobody's supporting you. Even without any support, I said, you know what, fuck it, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna fucking do it. And I didn't want my legacy to be um, just another hooker dead on the streets. I've seen so many friends die on the streets and I didn't want to be that way, so. I took it upon myself to do all this and push myself hard every single day, even though I'm still struggling with addiction. I've been 15 years clean now, and um, to me, that's a big accomplishment. And um, I've been blessed today. Um, Ascanti has given me another breath of fresh air. I almost went back to Winnipeg, but because of Ascanti organization and the BNRC and Flo, I want to thank her. She's seen something in me. She decided to take a chance on me, even though I was past the age. We won't talk about that. We're not gonna. Um, she took a chance on me, and um, and I continued to flourish out here, and and um, finally got my own place, my own vehicle, and starting to do things again out here and try create circles that will. Um, give a voice to people that can speak and especially people like myself and and I've been blessed today as well to be over here um, emceeing this event and I want to thank everybody for coming and listening to all the stories and um, yeah I'm going to I guess and on that um, it's better to listen and then uh, to talk sometimes people will have stories of their own to share Countless memories over lifetimes, all different, so maybe, the, so maybe the same. They all share the heartbreak, life, and joys. Um, so I'm gonna ask for one final dance. Any interviewees, artists, community members with experience of homelessness are invited to join in a round dance here on stage. There's been so much heartbreak in our community. This is for them as much as it's for you and your own loved ones. So anyone that wants to come up and do the round dance, we're gonna be doing that. And thank you so much, everybody.